I'm back with another video. And today we are going to demystify Azure Landing Zone. We have already created a couple of videos on Landing Zone, but it's a very interesting topic. So I'm back with another one. And uh, this time we are trying to cover it in huge detail uh, with lots of examples, lots of real life situations. And of course, a scenario where we can talk about all the things that we have learned in this video. It's going to be a big one, uh, but I'm, I'm hoping you need not to go through any other uh, document once you're through with this video. Uh, a lot of information is covered here. So just stay with me, be with me until we demystify the Azure Landing Zone. So let's get started. Well, our for our agenda, uh, let's stick to the uh, plan. Uh, what is our plan? We are going to understand the Landing Zone first. Then we'll try to see what is the importance of Landing Zone. Why are we actually doing it? We can simply go ahead and create whatever we want on Azure, why we need a landing zone. So importance, we need to understand why we are doing what we are doing, right? And then there must be some principles that this landing zone follows. We need to understand that. And of course, if we deviate from these principles, what are the trade-offs? We need to understand that also, because this is a landing zone, uh, which is not a hard line, but a guidance, okay? Uh, then there are design areas on which this landing zone is mapped. So we need to see all those design areas after design principle. Then we'll see each and every design area, uh, which are actually the pillars for this landing zone. What are the impact of those pillars uh, of, of landing zone? And then operating models, because it is ha it has a direct impact on landing zone, the kind of operating model the organization has. And accordingly, we got to prepare the landing zone, which will deviate from the design principles, of course. So you need to see how it is deviating and how uh, it is impacting or uh, trade-offs that we need to go through to achieve what we want to achieve as per the requirement of our organization. Then finally, we'll have a glimpse of enterprise landing zone and it will be more relatable. Uh, we will understand it better once we through with all these points and finally conclude with the hypothetical scenario. Let's see. Uh, okay. I was thinking for Diwali. So happy Diwali, everyone. Diwali ki shubh kaam nai. Chalo, hum apna shubh karte hai landing zone ki understanding se. So, what is a landing zone? In simple words, uh, landing zone or Azure landing zone is a well-prepared Azure environment where uh, we will land our workloads. That's the name, landing zone. We are going to land, we are going to land what? Our workloads, where we, our applications, our databases in the zone which is prepared already in such a way that without any fear, without any uh, uh, issues and things which uh, hamper our decision, we can easily land our workload. A landing zone is a pre-configured environment, right? So all the security in place, governance in place, if there is a requirement of scalability that is in place or networking, connectivity, everything is in place already. We just need to uh, host the applications there or lend our workloads there. Uh, hope it started making a little sense now. So <clears throat> it's a zone, well-prepared environment where we can lend our workloads or applications. Let's try to uh, explain it in a different language. That's how uh, we are planning these videos. If you can get something from what I said, Let's try to get some more where I'm going to uh, define it in a diff with, with different words, with different uh, uh, scenarios, okay? So a landing zone is an environment uh, that we set up in Azure that includes set of best practices, services, and Azure resources that work together to meet the needs 
of our application and data, right? So what I did, I just added one a line set of best practices, services, and Azure resources instead of saying uh, well-prepared Azure environment. So what does it mean? What is well-prepared means? Well-prepared on the basis of a set of best practices, services, and Azure resources so that, or which is required, which are the actual need of our uh, application and data to be landed there, to be, to be hosted there. <clears throat> All right. So essentially, the lending zone itself is mostly an empty Azure subscription. You must be wondering why empty? You said so many things. Yes, I said so many things. Empty because there is no application is running. But there is a virtual network. There are uh, NSGs in place. There are firewalls. There are Azure policies. There are Azure resources and services. As I said, set of best practices, Azure services and resources. So essentially, it's a empty subscription into which we uh, deploy our application workload, okay? But uh, it's not just about an application subscription. A landing zone deployment can also, uh, uh, not can also, but it includes all the foundational services such as management groups, uh, networking, security, logging, uh, policies, everything in place and then you go and deploy your application. So essentially it's empty, there is no workload is running, but it is well prepared. Prepared on what? Prepared on set of best practices with the help of Azure services and Azure resources. And what are those services and resources? <clears throat> well, services for security, governance, networking, scalability if required because landing zone is also modular and scalable. Right, so this is what a landing zone is. I hope uh, this makes sense now and you can easily define what is a landing zone now, okay? So let's try to cover uh, at a glance because we are going to dig deep each and every design area. So at a glance, we have like uh, <clears throat> eight or nine design areas, uh, network topology and connectivity, identity and access management, resource organization, governance and compliance, operations baseline, data management, compute and storage scalability, automation and DevOps. So <clears throat> these are the eight pillars of landing zone. We need to talk about networking. We have to plan for the networking, what kind of networking, what kind of connectivity is needed as per the need of our organization. Okay, then I said, I am identity access management. So we need to plan how we are going to authenticate and authorize our users or our customers. Maybe that is the application, but our users or our vendors who are who we want them to help us, or maybe we are helping them. So we also need to organize our resources. That's what the landing zone is, right? These are the pillars. We talked about resource organization, landing zone as well. So these are all the areas of landing zone. In resource organization, we will we plan in such a way that all resources are structured properly so that it would be ease of management. We will place the governance so that people can do what they're supposed to do. They cannot go and spin up VMs in some XYZ region. Just an example. So these are some design areas <clears throat> that we are going to uh, talk about in detail in our upcoming slides, how these design areas would be thought of and what are the impact of these design areas on landing zone. All right. <clears throat> okay, then uh, there is things like uh, importance of landing zone. All right. So what do you think would be the importance of landing zone? Because we hear this word all the time. Even you, you might find customer or the architects of the customer or the business people are just coming and throwing landing zone, throwing this word landing zone. They may or may not have the exact idea. I have seen so far incidents where people are saying, I, am, I don't care about the security, but plan, just plan the landing zone for me. How could you plan landing zone without thinking for the security? I don't think for, I don't want you to think for the this XYZ, but plan my landing zone. No, you have to think for all. And then, 
come out with the landing zone. You, there are trade-offs. You can choose what is more relevant to you, but of course you have to plan. That's what the complete landing zone is, All right? So what is the importance? <clears throat> Security and compliance. Landing zone plans from the, that's what the landing zone is. We is planning from the scratch, from the start. We plan as per the required security of the workload, required compliance that we need to meet. So that's the importance. Scalability, it, it, it allows organization to scale their environment up or down without having to redesign the entire architecture. It is streamline cloud operations by providing a clear framework for deploying and managing resources. And of course, cost. It helps you avoid unnecessary spending through proper resource management and, and budgeting tools. There's like few important examples. So what, what <clears throat> comes uh, with these this discussion, it is very essential for the uh, cloud workloads. Before you start deploying your workload, deploying your virtual machine, we should plan it properly, right? And if you're not planning it properly, what could happen? Well, there are things like you're going to risk your workloads because you think your workloads are secure, but it's it may not be secure. Maybe it's secure right now, but next day somebody just opened the port or somebody just uh, assigned the public IP or did something uh, unwanted stuff there, maybe unknowingly because he, he or she may not aware how cloud actually works. So if you have a proper governance in place, so these things cannot happen, right? So increased risk, if you're not planning it, you may not achieve your compliance and the environment, environment would not be structured, which is again uh, risky and more admin overhead. And of course, you don't know the unwanted resources are are lying around because your environment is not structured. And you will, of course, overrun the cost because of all those things. So <clears throat> landing zone is crucial because it establishes the necessary groundwork for a successful and secure cloud adoption journey. Well, cloud adoption, in the previous video, we did it pretty deep dive in the cloud adoption framework and landing zone is a part of cloud adoption framework. And I did mention in the previous video, if somebody wants to deep dive landing zone, just wait for the another one. So here we go. It Landing zone sets the stage for our workload to run in Azure while ensuring that all aspects of, of our environment are well governed, compliant and ready for the future growth. No need to think for re-architecturing if things are going uh, very good for us. We are growing rapidly. Landing zone can easily manage that. And <clears throat> neglecting to establish a landing zone can lead to significant challenges that can undermine the benefits of moving to the cloud. Because if you remember cloud adoption framework, the very first thing we ask, why are we moving to the cloud? What are our motivations? What challenges are we trying to solve by moving to the cloud? If we are not properly uh, planning our landing zone or groundwork, then of course we are not going to meet those things. Maybe you are moving because of the advanced security, but if you are not planning the security, it's it's not we are not going to get benefited by this, right? And... <clears throat> If you are moving for the cost and we are not structuring our environment properly, we are going to overrun the cost, right? And if we are moving because uh, any reason uh, and we are not planning for it, we are going to miss it, right? So that's why landing zone is important because this is the part where we are going to align all our business outcome and business motivations. Landing zone will help us doing that. All right, so <clears throat> we covered all these points and it's time to see what is there in the next slide. Uh, all right, design principles. Okay, then, uh, because any, any such thing uh, which has so much of importance and which is going to provide us something which is absolutely needed to run our workloads, landing zone, 
it's not like somebody just write it down there must be some principles that going to follow to create this learning zone and there must be some design areas that we need to apply upon right so let's see what are the design principles here <clears throat> the very first is uh, subscription democratization it's a very uh, easy word to pronounce but not for me but yeah subscription democratization if i'm pronouncing it correctly anyways it does not matter how we pronounce what matters do we understand what it means so it simply means a use subscription as unit of management and scale to accelerate application migration or maybe new application uh, development you're giving one subscription to each individual. Let's suppose your business unit, go take it and have fun, do whatever you want to do, your responsibility. You're giving one subscription to maybe application owner, right? you know, unit of management and giving it to that particular business area, democratization. <clears throat> Aligning subscription with business needs and prioritize to support business areas and portfolio owners, things like that. So. Provide subscription to business units to support the design, development, and testing of new workload and the migration of the existing workload. So what we are doing, we are demo <laughs> democratizing the subscription. Or rather, think of uh, Azure subscription as individual accounts. If you're coming from AWS, it makes more sense. I'm saying individual accounts. So actually these are like accounts or folders or the blink folders so think it just for the understanding think of azure subscription as individual accounts managed by different departments in a company this allows each department to control its own azure services like having separate budget budget for each team now it's not only about the budget if you talk about democratization it means they are also responsible for their subscription whatever is running inside the subscriptions that means <clears throat> all the governance policy security will fall under them which is required for their application of course the centralized one can also be taken care of but for now that's what the understanding is we are creating subscription and singles we are not managing everything through the single subscription with the centralized uh, control but we are providing everyone each subscription for their need <clears throat> let's try to take uh, the example and you can easily see this uh, this uh, diagram here which talk about uh, tenant group contoso uh, then <clears throat> platform landing zone decommission sandbox they are management groups we talked about many times of the management groups just a folder uh, but you can apply policies or are back there so uh, at, at the at the top there is a tenant group <clears throat> root tenant group you could say then there is another management group which says contoso and there are another management groups like platform landing zone decommission or sandbox and there are another they are management group inside the management group we can go up to six level deep but the ideal recommendation is two or three now, under platform, we have identity management connectivity, three management groups. And under landing zone, we have SAP, Corp, and online for this example. And under decommission, we have only decommission subscription. There is no management group. Under sandbox, we have sandbox subscription. And <clears throat> uh, under these management groups, we have subscription for each of them. That's what we are doing for identity, identity subscription for management, management subscription for connectivity, connectivity subscriptions. Similarly, it goes on. So we are giving one subscription to these particular services. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> this is the hierarchy, our management group hierarchy. Okay. Uh, now let's see what is the impact of deviation from subscription democratization we we understand like decentralized or centralized operations in an you you must have seen in it environment if you're not a part of a huge organization there but 
you understand like there's a centralized operations managed from a centralized location everything is managed and decentralized it is like distributed applications <laughs> like distributed it's not it's not centralized but decentralized so one way to implement this principle transition uh, operations to business units and workload units uh this reassignment lets workload owners have more control and autonomy over their workloads because they are responsible for their own subscriptions. Uh, how, but of course, within the guardrails of the uh, platform foundation. So let's put it this way. The policies or, or, or the uh, IAM, which is common for all the subscriptions would be at the high level. Uh, for example, uh, in this particular <clears throat> group hierarchy, if you see uh, all those uh, policies which are common could be placed on platform and identity and management, Contoso and uh, all these management groups, right? But <clears throat> if these these are this is an example of I would say a centralized uh, because identity is centralized, say management subscription and things like that, but these uh, lending zone for the applications are something the entire business unit is responsible for so maybe apart from the uh, apart from the uh, policies like these application let's suppose these applications must be uh, should be running on uh, region a so maybe there is a policy uh, above that you cannot run any other vm on uh, region b or c or d but apart from this, everything would be controlled by the application owners or business units, right? And uh, organization that requires central operations might not want to delegate control of production environment to workload team or business units. So these organizations might need to modify their resource organization design to deviate from this principle. So ultimately, <clears throat> what is the essence? What is the crux uh, of this is there is a way to organize your resources in Azure, which is through management groups. And these management group can go up to six level deep, as I said, and you can apply policies, you can apply uh, RBAC and even lock to, to these management groups. And you need to find out how to best organize it as per the requirement of your organization, right? <clears throat> because you do not want to apply such policies on which uh, your, your team is unable to work properly or your team is like uh, uh, waiting for people to give them access or approval of things like that because then you are losing the benefits of the cloud. <clears throat> so... Subscription democratization is the principle you need to think from that perspective, how you can better manage your resources. And that's how the resource hierarchy works. If you have a centralized management, you need to think from that perspective, who needs to have what access and how much. Then oh, we have the uh, policy driven governance, second principle. So <clears throat> it, it reveals itself, no need to explain anything. But uh, for the sake of video, let's say we're going to use Azure policy to provide guardrails and ensure that the applications we deploy comply with our uh, rules and regulations or organization's platform because we have applied the policies. I have given many examples like cannot spin the VM outside region A or cannot spin uh, huge or big VMs, things like that. <clears throat> Rules and regulations, all right? So use Azure policy as a set of rules to make sure all Azure services follow the company standards. And it's like uh, setting house rules that everyone in the family must follow. All right, okay. <clears throat> I can uh, think of another example for the policies just to make... Uh, uh, more more understandable, like applying a policy which will not allow any data stored in Azure, which is unencrypted, like encrypt your data, all the data that you have, that kind of policies will help us. And these kind of things will help us to achieve the compliance because we are applying policies, your data must be encrypted. or There must be tags on all the 
resources. Otherwise, you cannot even create the resource. Things like that. So <clears throat> what will happen if we deviate from this? Well, of course, it will increase the management overhead. Because now you have to go and manually check what is happening. Without these policies, managing compliance becomes more complex and time-consuming. Azure policy help us restrict and automate the desired compliance state within our environment. Forget the compliance, even the decent environment, a basic secure environment, we need those things. Like no resources will be deployed with these specific tags and tags are very important. It help us to organize, it help us to do the, uh, to figure out the, to do the analysis and get the insights out of it. Well, of course, uh, <clears throat> Uh, there are other examples for the policies uh, that will help you to manage your resources without even going through each and every resource. So deviation from this principle will lead to uh, management overhead, risk of security, risk of uh, high risk of human errors, things like that. Now, <clears throat> principle says you should have or you should look for the single control and management plane. That's what, if you if you think this principle, Microsoft is following this principle, they are applying this principle almost everywhere. Think of Enter ID, that's what they're doing. Think of Microsoft Defender. They are pulling all those services, Defender for Azure, Defender for Office in a single plane. Same goes for the identity. <clears throat> they have so many such, such things. Uh, because it helps. That's why they do it. That's why they put it in a principle. That's why they want us to follow it because it will help. It helps. <clears throat> but how? Let's see. So use a single system to control and monitor all Azure services. It's like having one remote control for all the electronic devices in your home. Now you could relate. Keeping 10 remote control or one. All those benefits coming into your mind are true. Stick to them. So it's best to have a consistent experience for both central operations and workload operations. Azure provides a unified and consistent control plane that applies across all Azure uh, resources and provisioning channels. The control plane is subjected to uh, RBAC, and policy-driven controls. You can use this uh, Azure control plane to establish standardized set of policies and controls that govern your entire organization. Because that's, again, uh, centralized control plane if applying policies there. So impact of deviation from this principle, you can easily think of using multiple system or third-party tools can make things more complicated and prone to errors. It is always better to look at one place for everything rather than seeing uh, multiple places for everything, right? More admin overhead, more uh, human error, more security risks. It's better to have a single control plane. Just go have a look. Okay, this is what it is. That's how we can control it. That's it. Azure policy is one of the example. From the one platform control plane, you're managing the entire platform. Like, millions of resources you can manage through those policies, okay? Now, another one is application-centric uh, service model. Now, what Microsoft says is, this is another principle for your landing zone as well, plan for Azure native services. Let's put it this way. Because we are also considering landing zone <clears throat> where people are migrating their resources to Azure or Greenfield, both, right? We need the landing zone foundational groundwork services in place before we deploy the workload. Now we're deploying uh, newly or maybe we're migrating from on-prem, does not matter. We need the landing zone. So focus this application-centric model, uh, uh, focus on moving and building application Azure in a way that suits uh, both old and new apps. What does it mean? It means like, do not just move your services uh, like lift and shift, but adapt them to fit the new environment. Cloud mindset. 
that we discussed in the CAF model. We got to have cloud mindset. That's what this actually means. We need to think for the services which is offered by the cloud with those benefits which are actually making us to move to the cloud. Rather than coming with the baggage of on-premises mindset and applying the same principles on cloud. Because cloud has their own services that works uh, seamlessly for the cloud environment. Rather you build your environment the way you have prepared for the on-premises. That's what it means actually. Focus on application-centric migration and development. Do not just migrate the entire VM, dup, dup, A to B, lift and shift or rehost. It's better you think about application. Don't think about the VM, but the application. How could you place uh, uh, best in, in cloud, maybe in app services, maybe it's an it's a, a application which could be pre-architected in the microservices and put it in AKS or maybe on container apps or or a single container, things like that. You got you need to choose the right service to host your application. So it's a application centric service model. So regardless of the service model, uh, strive to provide a secure environment for all the application deployed on the Azure platform. And this service model that I'm I'm, I'm talking about because it is provided by the cloud. So lots, lots of things has already been secured by them. For example, for IS, PaaS and SaaS, there's a shared service model. So if you're choosing PaaS service over IS service, you, you have to secure less stuff because other part has already been taken care by Microsoft or any cloud that you are in, okay? So if <clears throat> uh, we are not, following this, then of course there, there are certain trade-offs. Uh, all right, so I give you another example. I have seen that this is like not good. It should not be like that. The dev test and production environment. Uh, they have application running there but in a different uh, hosting platform maybe they have app running on dev uh, on, on vm on the dev uh, but on a container on the test or oh, sorry app service on the test and container on the production not a good practice you must have the similar uh, environment if it is a vm it should be vm it, if it is an app service it should be app service common approach <clears throat> Anyways, that's the application-centric service model is another design principle that we need to think for or follow while preparing our landing zone. Uh, okay, now, alignment with Azure native design and roadmaps. Simply says use Azure own services and keep up to date with its new features and plans, right? So why I was laughing, it's not like, or maybe it is like, but it does not matter what it's like. So what I mean is, it's not like Azure is saying, use my services, that's good for you. Or AWS is saying, use my services, that's good, good for you. There is a proper reasoning behind it because they're developing their services uh, very rapidly, very fast. And those are the new modern technologies, right? So <clears throat> if you're using Azure own services, Azure services, then you can keep... Uh, up to date with the new features and plans and it's coming like every other day there are updates so that's what they are saying it's like using the latest feature of your smartphone to get the best experience right <clears throat> uh, we can have another example like using azure latest database services for better performance instead of sticking with older or less efficient solutions because cloud offers you this Right. If you're on the cloud, you are in the in between of the latest and the greatest technology evolving every day. So what what do you want? You want to run your workloads on the best uh, possible platform or best possible service you want to use, rather than stick to the old one, right? And they offer you and they give you the path to easily move to that particular or that well defined service. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, don't want to carry it away with this principle. So it simply means uh, utilize Azure Native Services 
uh, think with the cloud mindset rather just thinking for lift and shift and uh, relying on non-Azure solutions may lead to challenges in, in integrating and keeping up with the Azure updates and of course, dependency on the third party, right? Uh, if you're an architect, you can easily understand less dependency is good. More dependency is not good. <clears throat> Anyways, so these are some design principles that we should keep in our mind while planning for the landing zone. Let's go through them one by one. Subscription democratization, think subscription as a uh, unit of management. Policy-driven governance, you need to plan for the governance with the help of Azure policies and plan as per the management hierarchy. Single control and management plan, that's always good to, rather than going to multiple places to uh, check things or apply policies or apply regulations. Uh, Application-centric service model, think from the application, not from the, from the hardware or from the virtual machine think from the from the application perspective always and align with the azure native design and roadmaps now these things will help you to create a proper landing zone for example you're not uh maybe you can give this example you're not creating a virtual machine as a jump box but utilizing azure native service as a bastion host right it's always good to use the native services you're not uh, simply <clears throat> doing rehost, but utilizing the best Azure service for your application uh, with the help of those charts that we have learned in the past, like choice of compute, when you need to choose the VM, when you can choose the app service, when you're choosing the ACI, when you're choosing the AKS and other compute services, <clears throat> right? All right, so this is what the design principles are and let's see what is there in the next slide, okay. We got the design areas now. Now, this is also a real stuff. Principles is, are good to know. This is the real stuff where actually the design work is happening. Okay. So, as per above discussion, we have uh, understood the basic principles of landing zone, the things that we need to keep in mind before creating or thinking or planning or designing for the landing zone. Now let's jump into the design areas with the very first says network topology and connectivity. Okay. Now landing zone is, is nothing without networking, right? This is the basic, absolutely basic groundwork that we need to plan for. We need to think for networking topology, how network going to uh, connect, maybe it's a hybrid environment, maybe it's a multi-cloud, or maybe it's an environment where we can utilize the shared services for the obvious reasons, right? Principle, if you remember, central management, less admin overhead, uh, less cost, more security. Those are some reasons you could use uh, this uh, shared services together. <clears throat> so, Let's proceed with the impact of networking and connectivity. The very first is the security posture. The way we design our network topology within, within the landing zone has a direct impact on the security of our environment where we are going to host our applications or deploy our workloads. For instance, the implementation of subnet and NSGs, it determines how traffic is segmented and controlled significantly affecting the isolation protection of different workloads. We can apply NSE on the subnet and we have to isolate the subnet as per the requirement. So we have to plan that for the landing zone. Virtual network and the subnetting and the NSGs or the firewall and the routing, things like that, right? So security posture, network connectivity, network topology will help you uh, to achieve the right security posture from the networking perspective. Let's think from the connectivity perspective. Because we, <clears throat> uh, this connectivity, uh, I was saying, where we have to connect, there is a connectivity with the on-premises, maybe through express route or VPN. There is a connectivity between the virtual uh, networks on the Azure, maybe between the regions, a connectivity between the virtual machines. 
anywhere you need to plan for you to think for it let's take the obvious example of on premises how we do we want to connect with the on premises do we need express route do we need high availability on on there do we need vpn uh, because these things will affect your performance and reliability so you need to plan accordingly how much data is going to flow you know ingress is free egress is cost involved so <clears throat> connectivity the design choice will impact how smoothly and securely hybrid environments function right and uh, for example you have multiple uh, subscriptions and you have multiple workloads forget about on premises but keep this principle centralized or control plane single plane so all these workloads and running multiple subscription can be easily managed through one subscription called uh, uh, shared services or maybe core network where you have placed your firewall. So all that <clears throat> can be monitored and taken care of. The connectivity, who is talking to what? You have to think for those things as well. These things would be discussed properly before you plan the landing zone. Uh, the plan is already there by the Microsoft, but you have to, you have to do the twitchings uh, for your environment. So scalability and flexibility, you, a, a, a well-designed network topology allows for future growth, right? Because the land, a landing zone is something which will allow you to increase and decrease easily. So for future growth, you got to increase more subscription. You can easily do that because it's modular. For example, implementing a hub and spoke network architecture can enable you to easily add one more subscription as a new spoke without uh, redesigning the entire environment and can have all the governance and policies applied through management group. Okay, okay, okay. Where I'm going right here. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> let's take an example. Imagine a scenario where a company is moving its on-premises application to Azure, they might set up a landing zone with a hub and smoke topology where the hub is the central point of connectivity to the on-premises data center and the spokes are individual Azure Vulture VNets that host the application. By using NSGs and Azure Firewall, they ensure secure flow between on-premises data center and Azure, as well as between the different application workloads. Pure and simple example. Uh, as the uh, uh, crux of all the discussion that we had. So that's what the <clears throat> networking topology design area is, and that's what it gives us. And these are the things that we need to think for. Anything related to the routing traffic connectivity falls under this networking design area. I need to consider before applying all those attributes or features. Okay, then second is IAM, which is most important. Identity and access management, we all know what it is. We have covered IAM many times in our previous videos. So let's quickly see the impact of IAM on landing zone because it's an access control. So IAM is uh, fundamental in determining who has access to what within the landing zone. Because we follow least privileged principle, we do not want people to see or work or access things that they are not supposed to. So what we gotta do, we gotta apply access control. By setting up Azure Active Directory and assigning roles based on the principle of least privilege, we control access to resources, data, and functionality, thereby enhancing the security of the landing zone. So how it's impacting the landing zone? We are securing our landing zone from the security and because when the cloud born, the security way of securing your environment is changed from perimeter security to identity security. Always keep this in mind. So your first defense is securing your identity. So that's what it is doing. Landing zone also consists of IAM. Who is accessing, what is accessing, how it is accessing. Second is uh, you can think for SSO or MFA <clears throat> also falls under IAM because by enabling SSO and MFA, we can 
improve not just user experience, but the security tremendously. Because Microsoft says, if you're just enabling the MFA, you are uh, dodging 99% of uh, identity attacks. Not kidding, it's true. Okay, then uh, audit and compliance, because proper IM implementation in a landing zone allows for detailed logging and reporting of user actions, which is critical for auditing and regulatory compliance. So these are some impact of identity and access management. You need to think for all these things before you plan for IEM. Now let's take in simple examples, just conclude everything, put it in words for the scenario. <clears throat> let's consider an e-commerce company that wants to ensure its developers have access to necessary resources without compromising security. In its landing zone, it sets up Azure Active Directory, integrates it with their existing on-premises directory and uses group membership to grant appropriate permissions to resources. Always apply policies, access policies on groups, not individual, good practice. They enable MFA for additional layer of security, given the sensitive nature of transaction data. They also implement conditional access policies to restrict certain actions to be performed only within the uh, secure on-premises network. So this example clearly gives the uh, impact of IAM on the landing zone because it is securing your landing zone uh, nicely and which is a must. All right, so <clears throat> resource organization. Now we know network, we need to plan. If you're planning the landing zone, we need to plan for the networking, connectivity, and IAM. All these things are clear. Now all the resources that we are creating in Azure, we need to organize them. That is the third design area. And how it's going to impact the landing zone? <clears throat> well, it will give the structure and anything which is structured is always beautiful and always uh, easy to maintain and less errors, of course. So clarity and structure, we can say. How resources are organized within a lending zone impacts the clarity with which teams can navigate the navigate and manage Azure resources. So it will less admin overhead. It affects everything from billing to management and operations. Yes, of course, operations. If it is not organized properly, you don't know what is happening where and you're just uh, going haywire. And of course, resource management and, and automation because effective resource organization enables better automation. Because uh, if your organized are not properly tagged, you cannot apply certain policies to all of them. And if it is not applied to all of them, you need to do a lot of manual effort. Or if there is no uh, ASGs in place, then of course you need to manage the NSG in it bit harsh way if the workloads are too many. So there are many examples <clears throat> for the resource management which impacts the automation. Uh, okay, then it's time to take an example to conclude this. Let's take two examples. The very first is a multinational cooperation organizes its resources by uh, geography using different subscription for different regions. Within each subscription, it uses resource groups to separate production environment from development and testing environment. This organization simplifies management and cost tracking across different environments and regions. You see how beautifully they have crafted their landing zone democratization of subscription and then resource organization through resource groups. And they're tracking their cost of different environments through subscription and resource uh, groups. Now let's take another example for resource organization. Uh, let's say a SaaS provider uses Azure policy to enforce naming conventions and tags for resources uh, at the time of creation. This enables them to automate governance and ensure that the billing of resources can be accurately attributed to the correct teams and projects. See how easily they can do it with the help of tag. They can simply filter it, get the information and put it out there. 
So that's how resource organization uh, impact your landing zone. Uh, <clears throat> now, the another point is, another design area is governance and compliance, which is another very important. Uh, we are talking about governance and compliance so in this video a couple of times. So let's see how it is impacting the landing zone. The very first is the, the application uh, of governance control impacts uh, how well policies and compliance requirements are enforced across the landing zone. It influences operational consistency and ensures the compliance is not an uh, afterthought. Good governance within a landing zone helps identify and mitigate risk associated with cost, security, performance, and compliance, so risk management. So in a nutshell, uh, the governance that you're planning and placing on the landing zone will uh, help you to achieve your compliance, will help you to regulate your workloads, will help you uh, to manage and uh, uh, pro provide certain rules uh, in place by which your people will, will adhere to and uh, there would be less uh, risk of security. There would be less risk of unwanted workloads. There would be less risk of many things which should not be there on the landing zone. And let's conclude this with an example of an healthcare organization. Why healthcare? You can easily understand why I'm saying this because HIPAA regulations. <clears throat> A healthcare company always uh, needs to comply with a HIPAA regulation uh, in its lending zone. It uses Azure blueprints to define a repeatable set of governance tools and Azure resources that include configuration of for HIPAA. This ensures that every part of its infrastructure is compliant by design, thus minimizing the risk of violation. So that's how you could utilize this design area will help you to achieve these kind of things, which is very critical. Let's see another example. If you're not so much familiar with HIPAA, <laughs> uh, let's say an online uh, retailer uses Azure cost management and budgets within their landing zone to set up spending limits and track usage against budgets. They apply Azure policies to prevent the creation of overly expensive resource and monitor compliance with their cost saving measures. Well, there is this, but what I'm <clears throat> trying to say, the objective is cost here. That's why they're defining to create uh, uh, any more resources. But before you apply such policies, you need to think uh, for your production workload, maybe there is uh, auto scaling in place and this kind of policies will not let your application to auto scale on a high traffic uh, demand or user requests. So you have to plan carefully, okay? That's what I was trying to explain. So by carefully covering the design area when setting up landing zone, organization can create well-structured, governed and compliant environment that reduces operational risk promotes efficiency and supports the scalable growth. Let's see uh, operations baseline. That is our next design area. <clears throat> Operational Operations baseline and operation baseline impacts the ability to monitor the health and performance of the environment effectively, which is critical for maintaining services, availability and reliability. If you do not have a proper operations baseline, then you don't know what is going on in your environment. Okay, maybe your customer will let you know, come on, man, it's not working. <laughs> All right, so you understand what I'm saying. Uh, it also affects security by ensuring that any unusual activity is detected and addressed promptly, maintaining the integrity of the landing zone. So that's what the operations baseline is. You, you, you need to place the baseline of operations or plan it accordingly, or maybe use the data matrices, everything to, to apply monitoring and management, security and compliance for your workloads. Okay. So let's take an example just to understand it properly. And let's try, it's time to take an example of FinTech organization, phone pay. <laughs> 
a fintech company uses Azure Monitor and Azure Security Center in their lending zone to keep an eye on system performance and security. They set up alerts for suspicious activities and performance degradation, which enables them to respond quickly to potential issues. Okay, so they have planned the operational baseline and applying alerts and alerts on like suspicious activity and performance and everywhere so that they can have the eye on each and every resource. It's, it's a fintech company. That's what they do, right? And they're supposed to do that. They have to adhere to the compliance as well. So many. Remember PCI? Anyways, let's take the another example of an online gaming platform. Yes, online gaming platform. All right. Online gaming platform implements a baseline of Azure log analytics and Azure application insights for the landing zone to gather detailed telemetry and logs. This helps them to troubleshoot issue rapidly and ensure a high quality user experience because it's a gaming experience uh, and users are crazy for that. They don't want to lose their session if they pause the game. Or if something happens, we know we should know what is happening so that it will not happen again. So proper telemetry and logs in such a way that you can easily figure it out and fix it as soon as possible and give the best performance uh, uh, for the user. Now, the data management is uh, another design area. <laughs> we do understand data. It's Essentially, it's all about data, right? So we got to manage it. For every click, for every talk, there is something which is generating, which is data. It's generating everywhere, every time. That's what it does. It just generates. <laughs> and what we do, we kind of manage it. Get the, we do a lot of things from the data. Uh, do not just think it's not good. It's very, very important because entire AI, ML, everything is like depend on data let's not talk about that right here it's time to talk about the lending zone and need to think for the data management you need to think for the data life cycle <clears throat> the approach to data management in a lending zone lending zone affects how data is stored accessed uh, protected and achieved uh, or archived impacting the entire data life cycle. So you have to plan for the data data life cycle. You need to understand the kind of data is coming in. You need to think how the data is accessed, how you got to protect it if everything is in place and nobody's using it, but you need to retain the data for X, Y, Z reason. One of the best example is compliance. So put it in archive so that you can save the cost and meet the compliance. And of course, data management, it also uh, determines how well data is protected and how easily the organization can comply with the data governance and regulatory requirements. It's not like if they putting in data archival, let's suppose it's, it's cheap, but it is cheaper in XYZ region. You thought, why not put it there? Maybe you're not touching your compliance there, right? And data management is something which is very important. Our landing zone will help you because we have applied, uh, because we understood the data and then we applied the data lifecycle policies, management policies, security policies for our data. Okay. So <clears throat> let's try to make some sense what I just said with the help of example. And again, let's back to our e-commerce uh, examples, which are much much easier to digest. An e-commerce company leverages Azure Blob Storage for unstructured data and Azure SQL Database for structured data in their landing zone. They implement lifecycle management policies to automatically transition older data to cooler storage and eventually to the archival storage and optimizing cost. Very simple example. What I did, what we talked about, put it in an example. Not good. It is good, but they, of course you want a different one. So let's say a pharmaceutical company uses Azure data link storage to store large data sets and Azure data bricks for big data analytics. Uh, what they did, they configured data retention policies and encryption to maintain compliance with industry regulations on data security. So that's how they are managing their data. The essence of this conversation is 
ultimately there is data that you need to take care of so you need to think from the security of data you need to think from the cost for the data and that's how you manage your data right that's another design area and to think for it and find uh, not finally uh, we'll say finally in, in the next point this one is compute and storage scalability <clears throat> The scalability design impacts how well the lending zone can accommodate growth in demand without service disruption or performance degradation. So this is what the resource uh, elasticity is. That's how it impacts. You need to think for compute and storage scalability. For example, if you're you're running a VM, you're you're uh, on a high load, you want one more VM to balance the traffic. Maybe you think for VMSs. Maybe you think for auto scale on app service. Maybe there is HPA on ports. So there are multiple things by which you can apply the elasticity or scalability on your compute or storage. Of course, it will optimize the cost and it will help you to make your customers happy with a good user experience on a high uh, user traffic. So you need to think for that. <clears throat> now the structure is in place. Now you're planning for your compute and storage and you're planning for scalability. You'll also plan for resiliency. All those well-architected framework pillars, resiliency and operations and performance and security. Of course, we need to place all these things uh, properly. Cloud mindset. Let's take an example to digest this one. It's time to take a media company. So a media company experiences variable demand for their streaming services. It's not Netflix, it's some XYZ Flix. In their lending zone, they use Azure Autoscale to automatically adjust the number of VM instances serving their application. This ensures they can handle peak workloads while minimizing cost during off-peak times. Very simple example out of the discussion that we had. Let's take another example. <laughs> Do you want the another example? Okay, let's put it in a, in a, let's take a different example. Let's suppose it's a, it's a business so it uses Azure table storage for their order processing system with a throughput that automatically scales with demand. During off-peak months, they reduce throughput to minimize the cost. The first example was of compute and the second one is for storage. That's why we took these simple examples where the scalability is a key feature of the service that we are utilizing on Azure. Remember that principle, alignment with the Azure Native Services. Why? Because of these features like scalability. All right, it's time for the automation and DevOps, which is the last but not the least designed area. All right, so <clears throat> automation and DevOps, automation within landing zone ensures consistent and repeatable deployment, which is essential for maintaining quality and reducing errors. And that's what everyone is talking about if they talk about cloud infrastructure as a, as a uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I just carried away. IAC, infrastructure as code or configuration as code. And, and it enables uh, faster deployment, DevOps uh, and operations as manual repetitive tasks are reduced, leading to higher operational efficiency. DevOps will change the entire way you define your operations and deployments and everything. So automation and DevOps, plan for automation DevOps in your landing zone in such a way that your landing zone will uh, add more efficiency, more productivity in your workloads. And these design areas will gonna do it for you. Let's just put it in an example just to make, just to understand. And uh, this time we'll take an example of a software development company uh, which employs ISC infrastructure as code using Azure Resource Manager template. So you could say maybe Biceps or Terraform does not matter, but it ISC effectively for their landing zone. This allows them to automate the provisioning and management of the infrastructure, ensuring consistency across development, testing and production environment. Uh, they're saving a lot of money because they plan in such a way infrastructure deploys, then the application deploys, the testing is done, everything is destroyed. Then UAT and then test. See that these kind of things you can easily achieve through automation and, and DevOps. 
let's take another example. A retail chain integrates Azure DevOps in their landing zone for continuous integration and continuous uh, deployment and delivery pipelines. This allows them to automate their code deployment process, enabling frequent and reliable application updates. They are, they are utilizing these services to be the most effective in the market. All right, so in all these uh, design areas, the impact on the landing zone revolves around setting up an environment that is efficient, secure, compliant, scalable, and able to adapt to changing business needs. Proper consideration of these aspects during the design phase of a landing zone ensures a smoother cloud journey and a more robust operational stance in the long term. So that's why it's important to consider all the pillars of design areas. These are the eight things that we talked about. I hope it was uh, informative, but we are not closing it yet. We need to understand the operating model, uh, which is not a big topic, but yes, I just wanted to cover it because it's sometimes confusing for people, including me when I was going through it once, like three years back. Anyways, the point is operating model. Now it's, it's, it, <clears throat> it's time. Uh, to understand the operating model, which is which has a direct impact on the landing zone, uh, because that's how the organization is going to operate. So, to plan your landing zone, the way your organization is operating, right? Because that's what they know. They they know to operate in this way. So, they're gonna follow their way of culture, right? So, you need to plan your landing zone so that you can achieve all the benefits that you want out of the landing zone without impacting the work. Let's put it this way. Okay, so an operating model in the context of cloud computing describes how an organization runs its IT operations to support and deliver services, particularly when the services are hosted in the cloud. It uh, encompasses people, process, and technologies that enable the business to function efficiently and effectively. All right, uh, in simple terms, let me put it in, in different words. In simple terms, imagine a restaurant. Its operating model includes the roles of chef, waiters, the menu, the kitchen equipment, uh, and how they serve customers. Similarly, a cloud operating model outlines how a team integrates with the cloud services, the tools they use, and the procedures they follow to deliver and manage those services. All right, that's what that's how they will operate. That's what the operating model is for an IT organization. <clears throat> Typically, there are three types of uh, operating model, centralized IT, decentralized IT, and hybrid IT. So in centralized, as the name says, a single IT department manages all cloud services and resources. This is like a central kitchen that prepares food for various outlets. Everything is controlled and consistent and managed through that central, uh, centralized kitchen or centralized IT. In a decentralized, different departments or teams manage their own cloud service uh, resources or uh, services independently. This is like each outlet having its own kitchen, creating its own menu. Then hybrid, it's like amalgamate, amag <laughs> ah, one more difficult word. Anyways, let's put a simple word. Combination of both centralized and decentralized models where the central IT uh, provides governance and some common services and individual teams have flexibility over specific services, which is more common. This could be compared to a franchisee restaurant model where the franchisee has some autonomy, but also adheres to the standards set by the franchisee brand. Anyways, the point is there's three kind of operating uh, model centralized as the name says everything is managed to the center decentralized which is like everybody has their own way of working in their particular team or business unit hybrid is like let's work together some i'll take care of some which is like common to everyone you take care of some i'm gonna give you some flexibility because that's what you need to perform effectively and how it impacts uh, the landing zone this is the big question because it's a video of landing zone so very first is governance and compliance. Remember, this is one of the design area. So this design is design area is going to impact as per the central operating model or as per the operating model. Let's say 
in a central model, governance might be restrict. Of course, it will be restrict and uniform across all cloud projects. More control in a centralized. But in a decentralized model, a governance might be more flexible, but needs to ensure minimum standards are met. See, so these operating model will gonna impact your lending zone. The first pillar which is impacted is the governance and compliance. In centralized, you might be applying thousands of policies, but in decentralized, you will not. Okay, <laughs> gonna plan accordingly. So another one is networking. A centralized model might have a highly controlled network setup with the restrict access controls, restrict of network traffic or internet. But in decentralized model might allow teams to set up their own network configuration within certain parameters. And uh, identity and access management will also be impacted because in centralized models might use a single uniform IM strat uh, strategy across the entire organization. But in decentralized models could allow individual teams to manage their own I IM leading to a diverse set of strategies, uh, which is not a good idea, but uh, maybe it's, they could have a handshake like things they can manage and things they cannot. Then, of course, it will impact the resource organization because one is centralized, one they want to manage their own resources. So in a centralized model, resources may be organized according to the organizational structure and, and controlled centrally. In a decentralized model, each team might have its own subscription and resource group uh, that they manage independently. Now, finally, cost. Because if you are moving any resource from here to there or creating or deleting whatever you're doing on Azure or any cloud cost is involved. So centralized IT might pool cloud, pool all cloud costs and allocate budget to different teams. But in decentralized IT allows teams to have their own budgets and manage their own cost. In centralized IT, if you are if you are if you are having all the shared services together and giving the service to the other uh, team members or other <clears throat> teams or business unit, maybe you are saving some cost. But in decentralized, for example, let's take a very simple example of Active Directory. If you <clears throat> placing or firewall, let's take an example of firewall. Because I'm I'm somebody who believes like you should have a single identity for authentication or authorization or multiple. So that's why example of firewall. If you're centralizing manage, you have a single firewall. But if you're decentralized, you might have like if you have 10 subscription, you're running 10 firewalls. So cost. Okay, now let's summarize this uh, in, in words with the help of an example. Let's say a company has a centralized operating model and they are implementing a new Azure landing zone. The central IT will design the landing zone to have a restrict policies, uh, a centralized subscription model, a centralized logging and monitoring to maintain the control over the entire environment. And Let's take an example of a decentralized operating model in, in, in similar fashion. The landing zone design might include multiple subscriptions managed by respective teams with, with more lenient policies that provide teams uh, autonomy to innovate and experiment while still adhering to the certain corporate wide standards. And yes, you'll find decentralized where the company is more oriented towards the innovation because they want people to go and utilize all the latest and greatest technology and innovate uh, something for the business. So in summary, the operating model dictates how the landing zone should be structured uh, to support the business operational efficiency, risk management, and service delivery objectives. Each operating model uh, brings different requirements and challenges to the landing zone design, influencing how good resources are managed, monitored, and governed. All right, so it's time to see what is there in the next slide, which is what? Which is a huge, huge enterprise landing zone. Because you need not to reinvent the wheel or start from the scratch. Microsoft is somebody who wants us to just, you know, simply utilize the uh, best practices or things or guidelines that they've already placed for us. Just like CAF model, guidelines similarly landing zone they have already built this landing zone you can simply uh, modify it as per your need and apply 
your uh, uh, your discussion with the customer on the basis of these design areas that we discussed and as per the outcome of the discussion you can apply those findings here on this landing zone as per your requirement you need not to have all these things the way microsoft want but you can modify as per your requirement that's what it actually means so <clears throat> we have uh, this uh, landing zone where you can simply see these are the management groups we have different uh, uh, this is the same that we have uh, i'll show you in the management hierarchy we went through this this is the same management hierarchy okay this one and these are different subscription with different uh, things running this is these the, all the management things are running in this subscription all the connectivity things are running this subscription like firewall express route ddos and this is the subscription for the uh, applications. This is for the sandbox. This is for the identity. So accordingly, you could easily understand democratization. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, this, this landing zone, if you see uh, very deeply, you would easily understand, consists of two kinds of landing zone, a platform landing zone and application landing zone. Okay. This is something which is available everywhere on, on Google or Microsoft documentation. So platform landing zone and application landing zone, okay? So what actually it means? Well, it simply means a platform landing zone is a subscription that provides shared services or the services provided by the platform, like uh, platform, right? Because Application landing zone is about application that you're running on the platform. Platform landing zone is the services or provided by the platform. We usually keep those under uh, under shared services so that all those uh, subscription and workloads can utilize them effectively, consistently, controlled way. Uh, like identity here, you can see this identity subscription. Every all these subscription everywhere is going to utilize the identity from here so identity subscription is going to be a shared subscription or the platform subscription or the platform so that's why it's falling under the platform landing zone and connectivity if you need to talk to anyone you have to go through this again you have to share this uh, subscription with all of them or the services running on the subscription would be utilized by all of them so it's a connectivity uh, subscription fall under shared uh, services and Finally, platform landing zone. Same goes with the management because that's how you're going to manage all your uh, <clears throat> logs, automation, things like that. So this entire enterprise landing zone is effectively consists of platform landing zone and application landing zone. <clears throat> and platform landing zone is a subscription that provides shared services, identity, connectivity, management, as per this example, to applications Ultimately, we have to provide everything for the application and then ultimately data. <laughs> but stick to the point here, I'm sorry, uh, to applications in application landing zones. So that's what the platform landing zone is doing, providing all the services for the application landing zone. An application landing zone is a subscription for hosting an application, which is uh, why this entire landing zone is in place to run our application in a effective and efficient way in a secure and compliant way and platform landing zone will help us doing that along with the application landing zone all right so this is what the enterprise landing zone is you can easily go and open it up anywhere because we have already talked about everything policies role uh, azure monitor cost everything and these resources that we are utilizing here has already been covered many times but for now for the sake of the landing zone video because we have covered all the design principles and design areas you can easily understand all those principles are applied here the subscription are democratized <laughs> aligning with the azure services as you can see policy network watch or def defender and, uh, no third party integration in this landing zone what was the other principle? Uh, centralized control, which is through policies and defender and identity. Uh, so all those principles are applied here and all those design areas, all eight design areas that we talked about is applied here. But I just wanted to explain this enterprise landing zone on the basis of platform and application landing zone. That's why it is here. And I hope it makes sense now. And it's time to 
consolidate entire conversation that we had in this hypothetical scenario where the large multinational corporation XYZ enterprise planning to migrate and expand their IT infrastructure to Azure. They need a robust and scalable or a secure environment. An enterprise scale landing zone uh, is an ideal solution for them. And that's the objective. XYZ Enterprises aims to migrate its diverse set of applications, including legacy systems, SaaS products, modern cloud native apps to Azure. They also plan to develop a new solutions leveraging Azure capabilities. The, their goal are to ensure scalability, security, compliance with international regulations and efficient uh, resource management. So in that situations, what we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about the components. Most of the components are similar to this enterprise landing zone. So the very first will be core infrastructure setup. <clears throat> core infrastructure setup is, is, is consist of, I'm just, it's a hypothetical scenario. I'm just trying to make sense out of it. If this is the scenario, we need to think for a network setup. So what kind of network uh, we, we are planning here, hub spoke network topology to create a scalable and secure network architecture. This model uh, separates concern by isolating workloads in different spokes, while the hub controls and manages the shared services like network connectivity and security or identity. <clears throat> We can, we can utilize Azure Virtual WAN or Express Route for the connectivity of, through this uh, subscription, through the centralized subscription for robust and reliable uh, connectivity. Uh, then this was our first network. The second design area was IM, Identity and Access Management. So we can utilize centralized identity management through with the help of Entra, Azure Entra ID which is like the new name for the Azure Active Directory and few more services. So Entra ID could be utilized here as a centralized identity management, which is one of the uh, principle. Uh, and we considered in our landing zone because we this is one of the design area. Then we apply RBAC and uh, uh, privileged identity management SSO MFA through this. Then we're going to manage uh, the resource organization with the help of management group, subscription and resource group uh, to organize resources for uh, governance and compliance. We're going to use the Azure policies, uh, of course, RBAC, locks and other stuff. Then another design area was security and compliance. So Defender and Azure Sentinel can help us here for unified security management and threat protection, uh, NSGs and firewall to protect the network. If you talk about operations and monitoring, Azure Monitor and Azure Log Analytics can help here for monitoring the health and performance of application and infrastructure uh, to track operational health performance metrics and logs, ensuring proactive issue resolution. Azure Automation and ASR can help us here for, for backups uh, for BCDR and achieving the efficient operations for for. for to automate repetitive tasks and ensure business continuity and uh, data management and storage. If you talk about that design area, Azure SQL, Azure Cosmos, Azure Blob Storage to manage structured and unstructured data to provide uh, scalability, high performance data storage solutions uh, because cloud native approach, Azure uh, native services. So because these Azure native services provide you built in scalability, and uh, for storage data lake and Azure HD Insight for big data analytics and storage to support advanced analytics requirements. And if it is uh, application and compute, then AKS or Azure Function and App Services for hosting various type of applications, uh, go through the compute choice of compute uh, flowchart, whatever is the best suitable for you as per the principle of the landing zone, choose that. Then connectivity and integration like API management and, and logic apps to manage APIs and integration workflows. Uh, then finally, DevOps and CI/CD for, for source control, CI/CD and application lifecycle management. Azure DevOps could be the choice, could be the tool of choice. Uh, <clears throat> so these are the design areas that we need to think uh, for this example and come up with the enterprise grade 
lending zone as per our requirement. It will look like this, the previous architecture, but maybe one of the few subscription would be get out of this enterprise architecture and few other, because they simply say policies, but we will define what all policies needed, things like that. So <clears throat> uh, I think that's, that's all about it. <laughs> It's like too much, uh, but I hope this is informative and you liked it. Uh, well, thank you for watching and I hope this will help you to prepare your landing zone. It will help you to have a, a wonderful or better or informative discussion with your customer. This video will help you to help your team to talk about things which is very important when they talk about landing zone. Uh, do not just throw the word out there. You should know the de design principle, the design areas, and how it is impacting your landing zone. Well, thank you for watching, and you guys have a wonderful day. Or Diwali ki subkamnaye. Bye-bye.